Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as Dan said, um, I'm, I'm about to depart. I thought it's a good idea to sort of uh, think about um, what might be some lessons of, of the program um, that took place while I was here. Uh, this is uh, certainly some uh, work that's shared with uh, Craig Beaumont and uh, Ashok Bhatia, and so uh, the three of us are collectively uh, responsible for it. Um, uh, so just maybe a, a brief outline. Um, uh, of course, I sort of I think everybody in the room sort of knows why Ireland got into a crisis and needed a, a program. So uh, I won't really go into that. Um, I thought it would be good to maybe just uh, remind ourselves of what the situation was like uh, back then and uh, what was the program strategy, and then look at uh, how the program worked in practice. Um, what are the remaining challenges and what are some of those uh, preliminary lessons uh, that can be learned from, uh, from the experience. And uh, it'll be good then also to, uh, you know, to hear from you what, what you think are some of the lessons. Uh, so maybe starting with uh, what was the program strategy, I think the first uh, point to make is that even before the program uh, started, there was already a substantive, a substantial large uh, response by the authorities in Ireland um, that preceded uh, the program. So the crisis uh, really started in 2008, and uh, for two years there's been heavy uh, uh, policy responses in the financial space. You, you had the uh, government guarantee, you had commercial real estate loans going to NAMA, nationalization of banks and capitalization of banks. <clears throat> there was already a substantial fiscal response. Uh, and same in the structural area, you had the Croke Park Agreement. So there were already uh, tons of, of things happening. Um, but uh, then still, um, uh, by, the, by, by the end of 2010, um, uh, the flight, deposit flight um, and net repayments of debt uh, continued in such a way that, market, uh, that Ireland uh, found it impossible to maintain market access. Um, and so, as a result, um, needed uh, to seek official financing. So, so the challenges that were there at the beginning of the program at the end of 2010 <laughs> were that already public debt was very high. It was already over 90%. Um, and despite uh, actions to capitalize the banks, uh, it was still unclear how much more was needed. There were sort of rough estimates of $35 billion. The public deficit had become uh, very large because it was very dependent in part on stamp duties, uh, taxes, and so when the economy collapsed and there were no more real estate uh, transactions, that was one large cyclical um, factor. Uh, and generally, recovery prospects uh, were, were in doubt. So uh, basically what we confronted was the, the, this uh, famous sovereign uh, bank loop. I thought it was just a good idea just to remind ourselves um, what that was, and in a way, perhaps, um, with, even though the economy is much in a much better state today, um, it's it's something that could still be there um, with very large uh, public debt. Uh, basically, the point is that you know, with the uncertainty of how much uh, uh, fiscal cost, uh, fiscal support was needed uh, for the banks, uh, you had questions about. Um, can the sovereign continue to access the market um, because you know the sovereign will have to service all that debt that the sovereign is taking on to uh, um, to help the banks so uh, this then raises uh, concerns about debt sustainability, which then in turn makes it uh, very difficult for banks uh, to access the market because banks are always constrained uh, by the sovereign in which they reside. Uh, and so you have that loop, and then in addition you had these other factors floating around in the in, in, in the background. Would there be bank creditor burden sharing? Um, would there be perhaps a, a wider private sector involvement uh, policy? Uh, so there were these announcements in Deauville. Uh, there were questions around the durability of ECB uh, funding, um, and generally sort of a European solution to the uh, to the crisis. So this the existence of this sovereign bank loop. Uh, really clouded uh, the recovery prospect. So 
I'll spend a minute here on this chart. It's uh, a little bit uh, complicated, but if you take the walk with me, let's say uh, starting in the top, uh, bank health, uh, and we'll, we'll take the green route first, which is uh, with bank health put into question, uh, there were large bank support needs, which put into question uh, public debt sustainability, in turn affecting the confidence of households and businesses. Um, who uh, were starting to, to become very reluctant uh, to spend and invest, which in turn depressed growth. Now, depressed growth uh, meant that income and employment uh, would be uh, depressed, which in turn affected households and uh, small and medium enterprises' ability to service their loans, <laughs> further depressing uh, bank health. And also, there's an indirect route through the property market um, if there's sort of a depressed uh, uh, you know, household and SME sector, then the demand for property goes down, which in turn uh, lowers collateral values, um, which again makes bank balance sheets look uh, less healthy than they are with, with higher valued property collateral. So that's one way uh, of the relationship between bank, uh, the public sector and, and growth and households. And then the other way around is that with banks in weakened state, their ability to lend is reduced. So um, uh, as a result, households uh, and SMEs are not investing, are not consuming. This affects domestic demand, uh, brings growth down. Uh, this, in turn, lessens the, uh, the revenue base for the government, um, which further undermines questions about public debt sustainability and, uh, and therefore also the funding costs uh, for banks go up because, again, as I mentioned, Banks are very dependent on the sovereign uh, under which they, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction in which they operate. So, so you have these sort of multiple complicated interrelations of balance sheets and flows between the various uh, sectors uh, that really uh, fed the, these uh, pernicious feedback uh, loops. So against this context, then uh, the priorities of the program were, first of all, to address um, uh, the immediate need, uh, which is to restore financial stability um, and, and sort of, you know, uh, triage the patient and do the, the, the first aid. And then also, uh, secondly, to have as an ultimate goal access for Ireland to regain market access uh, by reducing uncertainties, you know, with respect to financial system viability, with respect to public debt sustainability, and uh, with respect to the sustained economic recovery. So we'll take a look at, at both. Um, first, the in, uh, immediate need. Uh, so, uh, of course, a large uh, wall of money was made available, 85 billion, of which the Irish authorities themselves contributed 17 and a half. Um, to uh, show, you know, to, to restore confidence, to show the market uh, here we have uh, resources available to deal with that. Uh, and then to uh, recapitalize banks, because there was all this uncertainty, you know, how healthy are the banks? People didn't want to do business with the banks. So in order to, uh, to restore confidence in, in the banks, uh, it was really important to get to the bottom uh, of the vulnerabilities in the balance sheet. So this is when uh, the famous PICA, the, uh, the stress test in 2011 uh, was conducted. It was done with very uh, credible uh, assumptions. Uh, it was done by an independent third party and, and uh, so as a result uh, was, was successful and, and served as a model how to uh, restore confidence including the communication around it which is very important. Um, and uh, so there were further actions, you know, the ECB made a helpful statement in terms of the durability of the funding it has provided. Um, there was a plan for the banks, you know, viable, non-viable banks and so forth um, that, that helped to bring the situation under control. An important aspect was, and I'll deal with that in the next slide, uh, to clarify the burden sharing by uh, bank uh, creditors. Of course, in Ireland, everyone is uh, keenly aware of that. Uh, situation. Um, there were lots of uh, questions whether uh, senior unsecured uh, debt uh, issued by banks uh, should be bailed in or not um, with arguments uh, 
uh, on sort of both sides uh, uh, you know, of the argument that if you did that, it could have a large adverse impact uh, in European banks who were holding that debt, but also possibly in Irish banks, um, because uh, all the Irish banks, whether they are deemed viable or non-viable, might be all lumped together, and if one of them uh, is bailing in uh, the senior unsecured debt, then perhaps it may be difficult for the others to access the market. So that was one side of the argument. The other side of the argument said, well, um, these are people who took the risk. Um, they, uh, they were paid handsomely uh, for that risk, and um, they should bear the consequences of, of taking that uh, risk. Uh, in the end, um, lots of discussion. In the end, the program went ahead without uh, this uh, bail-in. Um, uh, although uh, Europe has since then changed, you now have uh, rules that clearly lay out uh, the hierarchy of uh, risk takers on uh, bank on bank liabilities. So, uh, so there's there's been a change, and perhaps that there's already an implicit uh, first lesson. I'll get to that uh, towards the end. Now, as we move away from the immediate uh, sort of uh, policy response when the program started, um, there were. Other issues, um, as I was saying, that the program uh, sought to deal with. So in the financial sector, it was not only recapitalizing banks, but once you had done that, you needed to do something with the banks. You needed to restructure them to make sure that they would uh, once again become viable uh, contributors to economic uh, growth. Um, there was downsizing, the famous deleveraging. That was in order to bring uh, banks' assets in line uh, with um, the liabilities that they would be able to maintain over the medium term. Um, and then, of course, as uh, non-performing loans went up, it was important to, to resolve them so as to restore the health uh, of the banks. I mean, maybe this, uh, just a, a moment here on why is it so important that, that uh, impaired loans are, are resolved. I mean, there's one channel, which is uh, if a loan isn't paying the interest that the bank thought it would be paying, that's, of course, uh, there's no income coming in. So it effect, affects bank profitability directly, but it also affects bank profitability indirectly because uh, uh, the funding costs of banks are higher. So uh, if there are lots of non-performing loans, the market doesn't really know, is that balance sheet healthy or not? You know, what's the degree of provisioning? Is it appropriate or not? So that uncertainty will make uh, uh, lenders, wholesale funders, whoever, uh, make hesitant to lend to banks, so they will ask for a higher return. Uh, which, of course, increases the costs of the banks, uh, also undermining their profitability. Um, of course, there are other reasons um, in terms of you know, the assets. If there's uncertainty about uh, the underlying asset, then that asset isn't being maintained properly and uh, is, investment is, is subdued, so uh, growth is actually less. So there are lots of other reasons why dealing with impaired loans is, is important. Um, but anyway, so we've got the financial sector. Of course, supervision and regulation was, was, thought, was thought to be a, a, a contributor to the crisis, so dealing with that was important. Um, and then the other factors, fiscal consolidation. Uh, I already mentioned the high deficit, so that needed to be uh, dealt with, and it was decided to do that. It was large and front-loaded, although not as large as in other countries, so it was phased over a longer period. Um, so as to take into account the harmful effect that uh, fiscal consolidation has on the economy. So on the one hand, it's, it's needed because you need to restore uh, an equilibrium on, in the fiscal sector, but on the other hand, you don't want to do it in such a manner uh, that it uh, you know, uh, sets off an adverse uh, uh, feedback loop. There were also some structural reforms. I really won't focus on them um, for, from, from our perspective uh, there was lots of stuff that could be done, but there wasn't necessarily sort of macro-critical uh, in terms of addressing uh, the reasons of the crisis, the causes of the, of the crisis. Uh, so the financial sector, um, maybe I'll... Uh, uh, I already talked about these things, so why don't I skip this? Move on to fiscal consolidation. Um, again, uh, yeah, that's just more detail. I want to leave enough time uh, for the discussion, so uh, I'll be um, skipping some of those uh, slides, especially when I already mentioned them. 
Uh, maybe just one point uh, to make here on uh, containing fiscal uh, uh, procyclicality. Uh, uh, there is this um, issue on, and in fact, uh, I guess it's in the current debate as well, on the, the sort of the headline deficit uh, as a percent of GDP versus uh, the absolute amount of, of effort. Uh, so uh, at the fund we have often stressed uh, to focus on the absolute amount uh, and to not be overly preoccupied by uh, what that means in terms of uh, a deficit as a percent of GDP. Um, by focusing on the absolute amount, um, there is a way to measure whether uh, you have stuck to your objectives, whether you have stuck to what you said you would, would do. So it helps uh, to build credibility. Um, uh, and uh, if the world turns out better, that means tax revenue is more than anticipated, that means you have a buffer, and that buffer is important because on the one hand there's always a lot of uncertainty with, uh, with projections for Irish GDP numbers, and also that buffer helps to get to the medium term uh, goal of, of uh, structural balance. Um, and on the other hand, if uh, things turn out worse, uh, that means tax revenue is less than projected, and that means uh, you would miss your deficit as per percent of GDP target, um, but you let the automatic stabilizers uh, work and avoid uh, an excessive tightening that could ultimately trigger uh, a negative feedback uh, loop. Um, so, uh, so maybe just to to emphasize at the end of this section uh, that you know there are these uh, these these trade offs and that the program tried to take into account that um, uh, fiscal consolidation on the one hand uh, was was necessary but on the other hand um, uh, there was a desire to avoid an excess you know to allow domestic demand uh, to recover and then avoid an excessive uh, tightening um, in the deleveraging uh, space, you know, on the one hand, one did need to bring the bank's assets in line with their liabilities because central bank funding can't be provided forever. So there needs to be a path, a transition to the new equilibrium. Uh, but that needed to also be uh, phased because if you insist on a disposal that's too quick, uh, then you can have a fire sale situation where you cause more losses uh, than uh, is necessary. Um, uh, and same in the, in the loan resolution uh, space that, on the one hand, uh, you need to deal with it. You don't want uh, uh, the banks, for some of the reasons that I just mentioned already, uh, you don't want the banks uh, sort of to become zombie banks with large amounts of unresolved uh, assets uh, for an ex extended period. But on the other hand, um, you need to give time for this restructuring uh, to be durable and uh, to be at a minimum cost. Uh, so th those are some of the uh, uh, trade-offs that we constantly dealt with, and it's always hard to know ex ante where exactly uh, you are in these, in these trade-offs. So it's decision-making under uncertainty. So let's have a look at, uh, at uh, how things worked in, in practice. I think the first point here to make is oops, um, that uh, we didn't really uh, anticipate how bad the euro crisis was going to uh, was going to be. It was much worse than expected. So you can see here, um, you know, some of the uh, uh, sovereign bond yields of of uh, four countries in Europe. Uh, they spiked up um, significantly, and in Ireland, you know, the program started at the end of 2010, and by mid 2011, you can see that yields are incredibly high. This is around the time that I came, and I remember. The first thing that I heard, everybody was saying, the program isn't working, the program isn't working, look at the yields. Um, and, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm happy to now see the extension of this chart. Uh, the yields have come down. I think today's 10-year uh, bonds are below 2.5%. Uh, um, so, uh, of course, there are lots of factors that, that contributed to that, uh, Irish-specific and, and beyond. Um, but so what else happened? Uh, well, growth, um, uh, as a result of the euro area crisis, growth turned out to be weaker than had been anticipated. So that first row there, GDP, shows um, what uh, growth turned out to be. Uh, so in 2010, minus 1.1, and then in 2011, 2.2, 0.2, minus 
And in brackets, you see the difference to what we had projected. So uh, in 2011, so in 2010, this is a projection that was made you know, at the beginning of the program. In 2010, actually, the economy declined even more than was uh, anticipated. In 2011, there was a positive surprise significantly, or 1.3%. And then 2012 and 2013 um, disappointed relative to projections. Now, it should be said that um, uh, the book hasn't been closed in 2013 yet. Uh, just like lots of people in this room, we anticipate that um, uh, the numbers for 2013 uh, may be revised upwards, and so that disappointment uh, that you can see there may not be quite as large. But um, so uh, some of that, of course, as you, as you can see there, was driven by the uh, patent uh, cliff that had a larger than anticipated impact uh, on exports. Um, yeah. Now, uh, oh, what happened here? Um, OK, well, the lines, you can just interpol interpolate them uh, in that orange area. Um, the point of this slide really is <clears throat> uh, to, uh, to show. So it shows sort of uh, three variables, employment, house prices, and uh, investment. Uh, and uh, the, the two dotted lines that are on either side of that orange uh, rectangle uh, indicate on the left-hand side um, the start of the program, and on the right-hand side uh, the 2012, June 2012, you know, uh, banking union and announcement by the ECB, whatever it takes. So those were key uh, moments that really contributed to uh, the turnaround um, in Europe and, and in Ireland. Um, but, but clearly, Ireland managed also to differentiate itself, uh, and uh, in part because of having built up a lot of credibility. Uh, and, and so, you know, these yields, 2.5%, are, are a good reflection of that. Uh, so... Financial sector progress, there's been a lot. Um, significant recapitalization, banks, you know, core tier one capital uh, is very high. So, uh, provisioning guidelines have been tightened. Um, there was the balance sheet assessment, and, and banks uh, took that into account and, and increased their provisions. Uh, there was significant uh, deleveraging. Um, the, the, the program was adjusted uh, to... Uh, to respond to concerns by the authorities that the deleveraging targets weren't set uh, properly. Uh, so there were uh, sort of lots of fine-tuning as, as we went along. Supervision was, was strengthened. I guess we can get, uh, get back to some of those issues later. Um, maybe one issue uh, that uh, is still a worry is, is um, the arrears. In this case here, you see mortgage arrears. You see how they kept on increasing uh, throughout the program period, so it's really only in 2000, in late 2013, uh, that you saw uh, um, an initial decline of of, of some of the uh, arrears. Um, I see the time uh, slipping away, so maybe uh, I'll stop. I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll uh, skip this one here. Just the, the point about the insolvency reforms. Um, you know, uh, they took some time uh, to implement and uh, the uh, fixing of the famous Dunn judgment uh, was uh, somewhat cont uh, contingent on that. And so that explains perhaps some of the uh, delay in, in uh, bringing mortgage arrears down. But then when this, uh, the famous uh, March uh, uh, was, was implemented, that's the mortgage arrears restructuring targets, um, that really seemed to get things moving in, uh, in 2013. So they were introduced in early 2013. Um, and, um, you know, since then, banks have been working on that. Of course, they knew that in parallel, the insolvency framework uh, was being implemented. And so that provided an additional incentive for them to come to bilateral agreements uh, with their borrowers uh, because they might have thought that um, a mutually preferable arrangement can be uh, found on a bilateral basis as opposed to relying on, um, on the insolvency framework. Um, 
So, but still, uh, major work remains uh, with a total of non-performing loans of about 27% of, of all loans. Um, the, uh, here, just uh, the point being that, you know, fiscal uh, kept on track despite uh, growth uh, shortfalls. Uh, so there was really uh, a considerable uh, uh, fiscal effort, of course, uh, at a cost, um, but uh, that allowed the, the Irish to maintain um, credibility and bring down interest uh, costs, which is so important in order to uh, ensure a sustainable public debt load. Part of the uh, program uh, focused on the fiscal framework uh, to strengthen that. Um, fiscal rules uh, were strengthened. You had the EU fiscal compact going on at the same time. Uh, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council was created. Uh, there are expenditure ceilings uh, in place and, and transparency uh, is generally enhanced. Also helpful uh, were euro area support and, and policies. So uh, the loans that Ireland, uh, the official loans that Ireland had taken out from Europe, um, margins on them were, were reduced, so interest rates uh, came down. Again, an important contributor to making the debt more sustainable because it's not only uh, the, num uh, the number that matters, how big your debt is, but it also matters uh, when that uh, debt is due. And so the maturity extension that happened in the summer of 2013 for EFSF and EFSM loans uh, was, again, uh, an important contributor to make uh, uh, debt more sustainable. Uh, and uh, also the promissory, the famous promissory note transaction uh, really allowed uh, Ireland to access um, low-cost target two financing for an extended period, which again also uh, uh, helps to make it more sustainable as long as uh, the government bonds that uh, the central bank holds are being uh, sold according to the established uh, schedule. Um, I've already mentioned uh, these, these key turning points there in, in general euro area uh, uh, crisis fighting the uh, June 29th banking union uh, and, and all it takes announcements. Oh, sorry, this... Uh, also didn't come out uh, so clearly. This was um, going to show you how Ireland's, Irish, uh, the Ireland's Target 2 balance has declined uh, quite a bit from, uh, uh, what is that, June uh, 2012 to March 2014. Um, you have uh, a, a huge reduction um, from about, uh, I have to tell you because you can't see it, uh, from around 100 billion euros uh, at, in June 2012 to around 55, so significant reduction, half. And uh, that is also coinciding with the reduction in Irish bond yields. So, um, uh, so, you know, the, uh, quite some success here. And as usual, both on the downside in the crisis and on the upside, usually effects are felt in financial variables first. Uh, they are the ones that react first, and real variables take longer to, uh, to, to react. Um, Ireland then successfully took advantage of these uh, positive market developments and uh, re-entered uh, the market step-by-step, uh, step, very, very skill skillfully taking advantage of some of these announcements uh, that took place with uh, the you know, first treasury uh, bill issuance shortly after uh, the summer 2012 uh, announcements. And, uh, you know, then reopening some issues, uh, having syndicated bond issues, and finally um, uh, getting uh, regular bond auctions back, um, which in turn also helped to, uh, 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 you know, get these upgrades by Moody's and S&P and so forth, which took comfort in the fact that as the interest rate was coming down, um, the debt was becoming more sustainable uh, and allowed them uh, to give uh, ratings upgrades. And the banks followed uh, right along uh, with the sovereign with, um, you know, these are just a couple of uh, mostly covered uh, bond issues, but also uh, the black one is the Bank of Ireland uh, senior unsecured bond issue. You can see how also here, as the sovereign uh, 
uh, recovered that allowed banks to, to uh, recover to some extent as well. Um, so what are the remaining challenges? Uh, debt is still very high. Last year we estimated it was 124% of GDP. Um, and that will unfortunately require sustained primary surpluses uh, for quite some time uh, to allow paying back uh, the debt directly, but at the same time also hoping for GDP to uh, improve that number as well. Um, uh, and, and so uh, the process of expenditure reforms and uh, tax base uh, broadening uh, would need to continue in order to allow that to, to happen. Uh, uh, banks' capacity, I was talking about, the high NPL number um, uh, arguably still uh, affects banks' capacity to support the economy, so uh, that needs to be resolved so that they can help uh, make, make this uh, a uh, investment, uh, to help promote investment in the economy, essentially. Uh, of course, with very high private debt, uh, households have 200% of their disposable income in household debt. Uh, that remains a challenge because households, um, you know, there's actually a very high savings rate in Ireland, but uh, all these savings are diverted uh, towards paying debt, and as you pay off the debt, uh, you're not really contributing to, to growth. Um, so that balance sheet repair presumably is going to continue for some time. Uh, and then, of course, raising employment from low levels uh, remains an important uh, challenge. Uh, these are just some detailed uh, slides on the challenges. Um, but let me get to the last section here, so we have some time uh, to discuss. And that is, um, what are the preliminary lessons that I, I talked about at the beginning? Um, oh, I didn't mention at the very beginning, so let me say it now. Um, there will be a separate exercise uh, by a completely independent team in the IMF uh, that will conduct uh, an ex post evaluation. Uh, and they will draw their own lessons uh, from the program. They will check on us. They will check on everybody how it went. Uh, and so uh, that uh, will be the final account. So therefore, this is, these are just preliminary. So this is not intended to be a whitewash. It's not intended to be a greenwash. Uh, it's just a sort of a, a, a look back. Um, so maybe the first point is that um, the program bought some time um, that was uh, used wisely for reforms. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, of course, the resources and the confidence that the program brought with it uh, allowed... Uh, the authorities to implement quite a range of, of significant fiscal and, and financial reforms. And that was also fortunately accompanied by significant reforms in the euro area. So um, the scale of some of these problems, uh, especially uh, with respect to uh, debt sustainability and the non-performing loans, uh, was, was reduced um, as, as a result of this problem. Uh, maybe uh, then the second uh, sort of point to make here uh, uh, for the overarching theme of, of the program is the importance in arresting uh, pernicious feedback loops. You have all these uh, uh, you know, negative uh, interactions between balance sheets going on. So for, you know, just to give one example, there's always a, a lot of emphasis on the negative impact that fiscal consolidation has on growth. We know that it has a negative impact. It's always hard to uh, estimate ex ante what uh, the, the quantity, what the, uh, you know, the quantitative impact is. Um, but one should uh, not focus on that in isolation because fiscal consolidation is taking place in the, in the larger economy. So what you have going on at the same time is banks that are not lending, households that are not borrowing because they are servicing their debt. Um, and uh, so there are lots of other factors happening at the same time that undermine growth. And uh, so th uh, therefore it is extremely important to try and arrest uh, these negative uh, feedback loops, both uh, through domestic policies, but in a monetary union also with the help of, of the partners in that monetary union. Um, with respect to the program, uh, one lesson that the fund had already learned from the Asian crisis and tried to apply in Ireland was uh, 
macrocriticality uh, macro of policies. Uh, so in the Asian crisis, the fund uh, had lots of uh, conditions on all sorts of things that we didn't really have uh, lots of experts um, to, uh, to deal with. And also, uh, so it was hard for us to follow. It was hard for the authorities to focus their attention because there were so many different uh, uh, conditions. So one key lesson was uh, for us to focus policy making on the key uh, factors that contributed to the crisis that were significant causes in the crisis and that needed to be addressed uh, in order to uh, make sure that the same kind of crisis uh, cannot occur again and to bring the country out of the crisis. So. Um, uh, so there were lots of things, you know, in my three years here, uh, lots of you guys, lots of people came up to me, wouldn't it be nice to do this, wouldn't it be nice to do that? Yes, um, uh, there are lots of uh, economic rationales uh, to do all sorts of things, but um, uh, uh, from our point of view, it was important to, to stay focused on, on uh, what really is important to make sure that gets carried through. Um, uh, then... Another uh, sort of lesson, adaptability. Uh, so I mentioned earlier uh, the deleveraging targets uh, were, were changed. Uh, so, you know, early on in the program there were targets uh, based on um, loan-to-deposit uh, ratios. It was hoped that by having targets like that, banks would sort of bring down their loan assets uh, and, and deleverage on the basis of that. But instead what happened uh, was that there was competition amongst uh, the banks uh, in the deposit markets and deposit rates uh, went up, which was not what was intended. And so uh, as the program went along, this was then changed to uh, focus more on the uh, 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 net uh, stable funding ratio, which is a requirement that's sort of uh, uh, scheduled to come in uh, through Basel III regulations anyway. So it was important to be able to recognize uh, problems in the design and to adapt and change. Um, safeguards were quite important. So uh, not to have fire sales, uh, both in the deleveraging space, but also in the uh, uh, sale of state assets. Um, it was quite important um, to make sure that uh, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't be forcing fire sales. Procyclicality, I already talked about. Uh, that was important to avoid uh, sort of introducing more problems uh, by excessive tightening early on that could have resulted in a negative feedback uh, loop. So, so it was quite important um, to, uh, to have some of these safeguards in, in place to deal with these uh, 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 trade-offs that I talked about earlier. Uh, ownership uh, was very important. Uh, the authorities took a very strong um, stake in the program. Uh, you know what? What we said all 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 the time was true. Uh, we had negotiated the overall envelope uh, of the consolidation, but it was up to the authorities uh, to decide how to get there. Of course, we would have opinions on that, and we would express these opinions. But um, uh, it was up to the authorities to decide how to get there, and um, that ultimately meant that um, they owned the program and that they executed it. And, and saw it through and made sure that these measures were actually taken, uh, even if, uh, if, you know, sometimes they may have been a, a more efficient solution or, the, oh, sorry, or some kind of a solution that we might have uh, preferred. So this, this ownership um, was very important and also arguably helped um, uh, buy and in turn helped uh, social uh, cohesion, uh, although uh, I suspect that might become part of the discussion. Um, with respect to the financial crisis, uh, a key lesson is, um, uh, you know, in a systemic uh, bank uh, crisis, speed and decisiveness uh, are very important. So early on in the crisis, uh, you know, between 2008 to 2010, it appeared that uh, the policy response was sort of based on the assumption that banks have a liquidity problem as opposed to a solvency problem. And so, uh, for example, the guarantee is, is one example of that. Uh, so one lesson could be that it's important to err on the side of caution and think that it is a solvency crisis. You can never decide this when you're in the middle of it, of course. Um, but if you're cautious uh, and think that there could be solvency problems, then you catch them earlier. You can act 
early on uh, and uh, you know prevent problems from becoming worse. Um, and, and so you have the traditional, you know, once you've identified viable banks, you recapitalize them, restructure them, restore to functionality, and the non-viable banks uh, need to be resolved. And the sooner that takes place, uh, the quicker the economy recovers. But of course, it's not always easy to, to make that distinction. Um, uh, and and maybe the, just the point there that you know recapitalization by itself is not sufficient. It's important, like it happened here in Ireland, that it must be followed by by reforms. Fiscal policy here. The point really is that uh, so fiscal policy was uh, phased in Ireland compared to some of the other countries in in, in Europe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the three percent deficit target that had originally been set for 2014 was stretched out uh, to 2015. And uh, some people argued that it's necessary actually to keep consolidation um, uh, you know, more upfront and quicker uh, to make sure that the turnaround uh, happens and that actually all that uh, consolidation is actually carried out in order to restore sustainability. But Ireland is an example where uh, you can have a phased consolidation and maintain the confidence uh, of the market at the same time and in fact re-access uh, the market, um, despite that phase consolidation, so uh, it, it arguably uh, did work uh, thus far in, in terms of accessing the market at very low rates. Um, okay, I mentioned these other points already. Uh, now, with with, uh, with respect to debt, of course, the point being that um, debt and growth matter. So uh, you know this uh, phase consolidation. It's, of course, an effort to try and bring down debt without killing growth uh, too much. But also with respect to burden uh, sharing, uh, the, the key point being here that risk takers uh, should be allowed uh, to incur losses. So that um, they, they take gains on the upside, they must take losses on the downside. Uh, and that's important uh, not only from a sovereign debt sustainability point of view, but also from a political sustainability uh, point of view, um, because as you as you rem remember in 2011, um, there was a lot of uh, political debate uh, around uh, the point uh, around the discussion of of the bank debt. In fact, that I guess hasn't quite vanished yet. Um, and so, um, a formal framework, as has now been established in Europe, actually helps. Uh, to set the expectations right. So if a formal framework had been in place in 2010, it would have been much easier for Ireland to bail in se uh, senior unsecured debt uh, because that's what would have been expected. Um, so uh, this framework uh, that's now in place should be helpful. And maybe the last point being uh, that um, engagement was quite important uh, from our perspective, both uh, you know, within the Troika for the IMF. It was a, a new construct to be working uh, with other partners, the ECB and the, and the Commission. Um, we worked quite intensively, had uh, long uh, debates. That's where all my uh, wrinkles and uh, gray hairs come from, uh, sitting all night uh, trying to collaborate to seek uh, common positions. Um, and, and also then uh, to cooperate with the authorities, um, uh, which uh, you know, were very competent and had established this EPCO external program uh, compliance unit that uh, was, for me, I had worked on a lot of uh, program countries. Uh, it was uh, a, a great invention to have one go-to uh, unit that, that would help in the cooperation and communication. Um, and then also, of course, uh, stakeholder dialogue and media contact uh, were quite important in terms of hearing what people have to, to say, uh, listening to them, understanding um, you know, how macro policies uh, drive considerations uh, in the day-to-day -day life, and then also in turn trying to explain why certain decisions uh, were made. So that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, much appreciated. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you.